Okay, so we shall start as we are going to uh, talk about this new Haggadah. And I am honored to have Dr. Marvin Chinitz with us, the author of this Haggadah, who is going to share. And we're going to do a quick little chat about the Haggadah, about Forum, about not power, uh, not Forum, but about Passover. And uh, the format is I have a number of questions. I have four questions, of course, and then some have some various parts to it. And then we're going to open it up and let uh, let the audience do some Q&A. So without further ado, I'm going to start by uh, reciting something. There was a UJA rabbi in the past, Michael Paley, who had a funny quote where he said that, you know, he always found it curious that a lot of Jews in America focused on three, they, they were known as like three holiday Jews, meaning they would go to two days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And he always thought that they had it wrong, that they should have really focused on three other holidays. And those holidays were uh, were certainly Passover and uh, Simhas Torah and Purim. And so with that, I wanted to start by introducing Dr. Ra uh, Dr. Marvin Chinitz. And the first question I have for you is, why did you write this? Uh -huh. Well, uh, I wrote this, this Haggadah because it had to be done, and it hasn't been done, which is to my surprise. Uh, Passover is actually the one of the most Zionist holidays of the Jewish calendar, but we never, never read about it. Because God took us out of Egypt and then brought us to the promised land. It's the beginning of the, Israel as a nation, and the nation travels to Israel, and Israel becomes our homeland. And we now, since year seventy-six, we finally have our uh, year seventy. I'm sorry, we, have, we now have a country of Israel, and it should be paramount, paramount in our seder to discuss it. The seder is divided into uh, parts. The Haggadah is, is you know, the beginning. There's the meal time, and then the second half. The beginning of the Haggadah, if you read it carefully, is all about going out of Egypt. And the second half of the traditional God is all about the messianic era. So we have the mealtime. So we have past and future, but in the present tense, we should discuss the mealtime, all the issues involving Israel, Zionism, and increased support and love of this, and transmit this message of, and a heritage of loving Israel from parent to child. And it's so important to do this, especially at this time when we're attacked from every angle of the entire world. We have to learn how to defend Israel, how to love Israel, and how to support Israel. And my Haggadah really covers all those all those goals. So I encourage you to read it. Yeah, no, fantastic. For those of you uh, at the end, we'll put in a chat uh, where you can buy the book. It's certainly on Amazon as well as in Geffen Publishing. But I was uh, I was amazed. Even just just open it up right away. You can see the preface. It was written by David Harris, and I'm going to read to you what he had written, which is that Dr. Chinnett wants Jews celebrating Passover to include this deeper understanding of Israel, of Zion, Zionism, and of Zion, which we all know is so important, especially today. So the um, let's start with the order. Let's start with the Seder, which means order. And I noticed in your book, I'm going to put it on the screen here. This is what your Seder looks like. And if you want to just kind of describe how you brought Israel even into this, uh, the basics sure. order. And I, I highlighted a few things, you know, where you are talking about Israel all over the Sagada. So take it away. Okay. So uh, this is the traditional order of the, of the Seder, but we really start the order of the Seder in my family right after Purim when I give out homework assignments of Zionism. Everyone has to go to, Everyone has to give a five-minute uh, summary of a answer to the question I asked them. And this year, it's going to be all the aspects of Zionism that I covered in my Haggadah. And then when we march into the... We, we start in the, in the living room with preliminaries, a lot of games and, and stuff. But then, then uh, grandchildren put red strips of paper on the doorposts of the dining room. We all march in in costume. And we sit down at the Seder this year. It's going to look a lot different than previous uh, Seders over the years. We're going to have an Israeli flag, a tiny one on the Seder plate. We're going to have a large Israeli flag on our wall. We're going to have uh, an empty chair. Uh, and the empty chair is going to be for 
either one of the hostages or somebody who died in the recent Gaza war, and someone's going to read the biography, it's going to be a little, very sad and, and moving. And we're also going to start out with uh, the fifth cup of, of wine. Uh, there, there are five verbs that describe how God's going to help us. And the fifth one, to bring us to the promised land. When the Haggadah was written and compiled about the year 800, was there was no the promised land it didn't exist for us. It was all a messianic dream. But now that Israel exists, we're, we're entitled to that fifth cup. But I deviate a little bit from the theme of Passover, where God does everything for us and we're all passive. So in this time, when we we start out with drinking the fifth cup, we're going to drink a little bit of the say a, say the simple blessing, drink a little bit of the fifth cup, and then pour the rest into Elijah's cup. We're going to fill up Elijah's cup with every member's uh, cup of wine to show that we have to partner with God in uh, in our deliverance and our protection of Israel. We can't just rely on God alone. Everyone has to participate. So when we have the order here, yeah, have it down I'll on the put screen. that back up. Okay. But uh, yeah, now I, I was going to keep going. And, and okay. as you go through the, the order, also talk about what makes this Haggadah different than all others. Yeah. So uh, you put that through, back on the yes. screen or no? Okay. Yep. All right. So, you know, we, we sing the traditional song. It's very boring. Kai Day, Shurukhats, and there's all the, all the, all the um the whole order of the satyrs there, but I've given new new meanings to it. So and we've known for for, for hundreds of years that you're allowed to take the simple agata and make elaborate on commentary. So what's missing in our current agata when you have the whole family there, you can't just leave Israel on the side. You have to we have to discuss it, teach it. So I've, every almost every commentary of the Haggadah that I've that, that I've edited has is related to modern Israel. So Kadesh, we're going to recite it, the first cup of wine, the fifth cup of wine in honor of Israel. We wash our hands because we're going to wash away the diaspora of feeling weakness, apologetic, and hopelessness now that we have a homeland. Uh, we have to be strong in defense of Israel. We, we can't be passive anymore. Karpas. Uh, eating a green vegetable. The, the second biggest Haggadah celebrated in the Bible is when Joshua took the Jews, the Israelites across the Jordan. And it was a time, it was the day of Passover. And that's when Mana stopped and we're, he came with an army of 40,000 people and he started eating of the produce of the land. So you have to think of Karpas, the agriculture in Israel, and we know is so important. All the volunteers are going to him to help the, with the agriculture where there are no, no manual laborers anymore. So all of this is re very relevant to today. Yachatz is breaking the middle of matzah. There are many explanations for this. But mine is to close the gap between the Jews of Israel and the Jews of the, the, Jews of the diaspora. And uh, before October 7th, that gap was, was widening by the day. And I'm hoping that gap is much, is much shorter now, but there's still room to, to improve our relations with, with, between the Jews of Israel and the Jews of the diaspora. And we tell the story of Exodus, we're going out of Egypt, but now we told, tell the story of the rebirth of Israel after almost 2,000 years. We wash our hands so we can shake hands across the ocean with embrace our fellow Jews. And so we, I mean, remember the, the bitter herbs, you remember the Holocaust, of course, and, uh, and go on. And so we laid everything in the Haggadah to what's going on now. It just makes it relevant for today. And, and it makes yeah. it more important for the families to see that it's not just an ancient holiday we're celebrating. Yeah. Talking about ancient holidays or ancient songs or one of the most popular songs, I want to jump to the Dayenu because it struck me in your text, in the Haggadah, not only do you include your own version of Dayenu, which I want you to share with everybody, but you were able to reprint a Dayenu from the 1940s during the Holocaust times. And I, I, I'm going to put that on the screen now. If you can just share, sure. how did this come to be? How did you find this and, and uh, you know, uh, print it and so forth? So this, uh, in 1946, uh, survivors of the, of the Holocaust in Munich 
wrote their own Haggadah. It's called the Survivor's Haggadah. It was written in, actually in Yiddish and it was published by the American army. Uh, in the year 2000, uh, the, the Jewish press was able to make it, made it publish it as an Haggadah. Uh, in, in English, they translated it into English and it was very moving. Because the, the, the Dianu prayer and the traditional Agata, it, it ends with build, build, building the temple and then it just stops. But the, the survivors went through every disaster from uh, from the Crusades on. And they made, they sort of turned the Dianu into, uh, we suffered, we, it would have been enough, but then we had more suffering and that would have been enough. And if you look here, at, when they went go all the way to the, uh, through the Holocaust, they given us Hitler, but no ghettos. You can say Dianu. Given us ghettos, but no gas chambers and crematoria. Dianu. Give us gas chambers and crematoria, but our wives and children have not been tortured. It goes on. I mean, it's very depressing. And it ends where, where all these things happen to us. We have to make Aliyah, even if illegally, wipe out the Galut, build the chosen land to make a home for ourselves and our children in eternity. So we couldn't. The, the survivors ended there, but I realized we have to continue this, this process. And so I wrote my own continuation of the Dianu until the current day. Join the meeting. Yeah. So I'm going to now put on the screen your version of yeah. the Dianu. And and if you can also explain the last line, which isn't yeah. the typical yeah. last line. Yeah. So and if you want to read this. Sure. Had God given us the UN partition vote, this is 1947, but not the victory of the War of Independence, we would have been content. The the uh, the Holocaust survivors, instead of using translating it to it would have been enough, they made it we have would have been content, which I think is more relevant. Had he given us the victory of the War of Independence, but not the victory in the Six Day War, would have been content. Had he given us victory in the Six Day War, but not unified Jerusalem, we would have been content. Had God unified Jerusalem, but not given us the war, victory in the Yom Kippur War, we would have been content. Had God given us victory in the Yom Kippur War, but not released the refuseniks of the Soviet Union, we would have been content. Had God released the refuseniks, but not stopped the intifadas, we would have been content. Had God stopped the intifadas, but not given us the means to stop Hamas and Iran, we would have been content. If God gives us the means to stop Hamas and Iran, but does not give us the means to stop anti-Semitism, BDS, and assimilation, we would be content. But if God gives us all the means to stop anti-Semitism, BDS, and assimilation, but does not bring us Jewish unity, all may be lost. And So can you explain more about that? Sure. You have to realize I, I wrote this before October 7th, and all these... The, the fracture of Judaism going on before October 7th was horrible in Israel because of the political situation and America because America because so many Jews were rejecting Israel because of what was gone and going on in the political situation and we we're losing our American youth in colleges they were it, it was horrible so and all throughout the history of of, Ju, of Judaism it's always been causes hatred disagreements fracture fractions that have that have ruined us and I, when i volunteered in israel in december uh, i was there for the whole month i noticed that in every screensaver and every on every street there's a sign that says together we will win and the importance is that together the unity of the jews is the most important part to ensure our survival in israel and ensure judaism to survive in america and that's the message I bring. If we don't have unity, we may fail again, because that's been the history of the Jews throughout this time. Yeah. So I pray, I pray for unity, and I pray for this Haggadah will just give an impetus for that to happen, especially in the unity in our own families. It's, that's where it starts. That's where I'm hoping it happens. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, play on that a little bit, because I know you make a point throughout your Haggadah to talk about the responsibility of the parents. Right. Not the institutions or the teachers, or which are all important, but you really drill home about the parents here. Good, so good. I'm I'm glad you said that. The Passover is a unique holiday in, among all the holidays in Judaism because it's celebrated at home, and and the primary event is at home. 
and we're at home in the, in the seder. The home becomes the the home becomes the the temple. The home becomes the synagogue, and the leader of the seder, whoever it is, becomes you can call it the rabbi or the priest. Some say we put on a kittle, and and the children and the participants become the disciples of the rabbi. And this is the time when we pass on the heritage of Judaism from one generation to the next. Uh, it's 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 an awesome responsibility. The you know, my kids went to day school, summer Jewish summer camps, but the lessons of, of loving Israel and understanding Israel actually started out in the home. The love of Zionism comes from the home. You can't rely on on outside uh, outside um, venues such as school or Zionism, Sioux school or camp, to teach the family. It has to come from the children, from the parents to the children. The children have to understand how important Judaism and Israel is to the parents. And that transmits the message. And it also tr transmits the message, we have to be proud that we're, that we're Jewish. This, we've always been apologetic for saying in the, in the Haggadah, and if you look in the Kiddush, that we're the chosen people. We, are, we have to impart the message to our children that we are special, we are chosen, we're privileged, and we should be grateful from God that we, that we are Jews. And there should be no apologetics. This, pr this, this pride, honor, ends up being a way to, to defend Israel as they grow up. And it's so, the message is so important. And I feel it's the parents' primary responsibility to, to, to make this happen. Yeah, no, thank you. And I know it makes me think of Barry Weiss and her book on anti-Semitism and her saying the best way to combat it is just to be proud Jews and, and celebrate the holidays and, and continue being and yes. acting as a proud Jew. Yeah. So thank you. Um, one thing I noticed, I wanted to get your uh, talking about family. I noticed the book is dedicated to your late sister, Louise. Can you share a little about her or why yeah. it's dedicated sure. well, to her? I, I was blessed with three sisters and no brothers. Uh, my sister, Louise, uh, three years ago, passed away from cancer. It was very sad, but she was the primary Zionist in our family because she's much older than I am. And... Uh, she volunteered one month every year in to, to teach uh, English as a second language in Arad in Israel. It's a, it's, a poor, it's a poor small city. And she went to every APAC event and she started the tradition in our family of volunteering in Israel. And uh, we've all been doing it since. So we remember her very fondly, especially on Passover. She was so enthused about, uh, about Passover and singing. So, it's sad when we talk about it because she, when she nice. passed away. Yeah. Yeah. Is would you say the Passover were was her favorite holiday, or, or actually more important, is Passover your favorite holiday? Well, Passover is my entire family favorite holiday. Uh, even if they don't think it is, that is. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> it was by far. And the whole family gets together, and uh, it's just the, the love and unity of the family. We're, we're blessed that uh, we're, we're together as, as much as possible. And, we all come together on Passover, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your section about the four the four sons, uh -huh. and because you threw in something I hadn't I haven't seen before, which is about the fifth son, who doesn't show up for right. the seder. Can you share uh, your you know your interpretation about that and how you address the fifth son who might not even show up? Sure. Let me let me start out uh, by addressing the, the second son, the wise son, or maybe the or the one was what the, this the wise son. Uh, before we go to the fifth son, let's make it the let's make it the child, so we don't get in trouble here. Okay. okay. The wise child is not called the good child; he's called the wise child, and the, the interesting commentary about that is the wise child asked to explain all the laws, rituals, and so on of, of the Passover holiday. But he never mentioned what the, the, the wise child never said, what am I, what he's going to do with that? So if you study everything, but don't do any action, but don't become, then it's not good enough. You have to act on the knowledge that you have. And that's why the wise child, the wise child is not called the good child. It would be good if he took all the knowledge and put it to good use, but we don't know what the wise child is going to do about that. So it's a message 
that we have to act on our wisdom and not just studying the stuff is not enough. We have to, we have to, we have to be active in defending Israel and loving Israel and, and so on. Regarding the fifth child, uh, I have a collection that you can't see my bookcase sort of behind my back, but it's about 75 Haggadot, and many of them mention the fifth child. The fifth child is the child that is not there. So why didn't that fifth child come? So one commentary says uh, the fifth child assimilated. There's no, no interest in joining the family, completely separated himself from the family. And we pray that fifth child, when we open the door uh, to welcome Elijah, we hope the fifth child is going to be there. It's going to be getting emotional. And then, of course, uh, we, we the fifth child could represent uh, someone from the Holocaust who passed away because the Holocaust just didn't kill six million people. It killed all their descendants. So you can think of the millions and millions of children and grandchildren, how many generations we lost from losing the Holocaust. And that fifth child with the empty, empty seat is going to represent uh, one of that generation. And then the fifth child could be, uh, as I said before, someone we lost in uh, October 7th to make it more relevant. Uh, and that's what, we, that's what we're going to symbolize our family with. One of, my, one of the medical students that I uh, supervised in, in December, her cousin is still a hostage in Gaza. So we're going to use her cousin, Carmel Gott, to, uh, to represent the fifth child. But it's, it's, it's very emotional. We look at the fifth child. Of course, some of us have had tragic losses in our family, have lost a child. And uh, that also would be the, uh, an empty child, for the empty seat for that person. So it's quite an emotional uh, scene to think about whoever's missing in, that, in this age of that year. Yeah. Um, how are you going to, uh, to honor the hostage? Are you going to put their picture on a chair? Or are you going to put a glass of wine there? What's any recommendations? Right. So uh, when we start when we start our seder, we're going to start with hatikva, and then we're going to start. Then we're going to do the fifth cup of wine. Then we're going to do the prayer for Israel, the prayer for the the Israeli soldiers, the prayer for the IDF. That's written in an agada. Unfortunately, I could not put in the prayer for the hostages because the prayer for the hostages is in every is in sidurim that are copyrighted, and I could not get permission. I tried my best to do it. So if you can get a copy of the prayer for the hostages, it's it's also very moving. And yeah, I th I uh, thought you were going to say a different reason that perhaps well, there won't be hostages by the time it comes to print or something. Yeah, well, I mean, you're mouth to God's ears. I hope so. I hope there are survivors of these hostages. But so that that that's how we're going to remember. And 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 there are various uh, anecdotes of uh, tragedies that happened in modern Israel throughout, during my in the, in the Haggadah that I wrote. So we'll pray that, uh, yeah, we'll pray. I mean, the, um, you, you know, you mentioned you have a collection of what, 75 plus Haggadahs. Right. And it sounds almost common sense to start with Hatikva and start with a prayer for Israel and a prayer for the IDF. But I've never seen it before. Have you? Right. Is that, uh, and, and why not? Well, it's, it's a good question. Well, there might, well, my family's been using this red and yellow Haggadah for everybody. Uh, they've had the words that I take for in the back page in, 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 in English, not in Hebrew. Uh, I think it's paramount in importance now. And why, why, why wasn't they, uh, why wasn't it there before? Because they were traditionally the, the, everything about the Seder and Haggadah has passed from generation to generation. And before 1948, there was no Israel. So now everything has to change. Uh, I look at my Haggadah as if it were compiled and written after 1948. If they got it written instead of 800, we written today, it should look like my Haggadah. That's that's the way I feel I was writing it. Yeah. So, so I hope, it, um, I hope so, the message gets across. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I, I enjoyed it. I purchased it. I purchased a few now. And we'll certainly be using this. Thank you. Thank you. What, uh, you know, for the people who are running their typical Seder and might not have time to buy your book, although we highly recommend it, what are four things that they might want to change or add to their typical Seder to bring Israel front and center 
during this Passover? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, some of the stuff is sort of highlighted what we do. Uh, I think it's very important to give assignments before before the Seder. Uh, at least a few weeks before, you tell them we're going to make a serious Seder this year. It's not just going to be fun and games and, and, and the focus will be on the meal. Uh, the focus for the, for the cook, cook of the meal, that's the focus. But intellectually, uh, we have to transmit this is going to be a serious event. We want to make Israel a, a, a significant part of this and the, love of, and the love of Israel. And to give out assignments ahead of time is very important because if, we get, if, the, if you give out assignments to the late teens and, and young adults, everyone pays attention to them. Uh, if I keep on babbling on, it, it doesn't work. I, this, people start rolling their eyes like some of you probably are doing right now. We play Jewish Jeopardy in, in our house uh, in the preliminaries before we, before the Seder starts, and one of the one of the answers is Babylon, and the children already know that's what Marvin does when he when he talks to them the Seder he babbles on, so I try to avoid that, and uh, by giving out the assignments, everybody respects each other that way, and uh, I also try to make the politics apolitical. I, I'm giving facts and basics, but I. I didn't want to go into Likud or right wing or left wing, uh, but the information is, is is fascinating. I gave the differences between regarding Israel between Jews or progressive left, liberal, central, right wing, peace processes. All, all these things are so important. Palestinian refugees, Arab refugees, how we how we can, what to do about the situation in Gaza, the history of Gaza. Uh, but so. The thing, but not only you have to talk about it, you have to make the symbols of it. So that's why with the Israeli flag, perhaps the fifth cup of wine. By the way, traditionally, the when the Gada was compiled, the amount of wine drink drunk was not four 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 cups of wine. The wine was diluted. So if you have the fifth cup of wine, just dilute it a little bit. Don't make people drunk, <laughs> but it'll work yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, I'll be certainly adding some of those suggestions. And to our Seder. The other thing I, I made me think about was you have not just the Shulharn Arot, my wife's favorite page of the Haggadah, the festive meal, but next door, then you list a whole bunch of questions. Right. You have about 15 questions here that right. are suggested topics of discussion during the dinner meal. And, right. you know, uh, you know, I, I'll read a few. To what extent is criticism of Israel acceptable? Is there a red line? Um, you know, is the BDS movement have any justification? Um, you know, we read about the the uh, what is the definition of anti-Semitism? Do we agree with it? And on and on. So, really interesting questions. Uh, how, how did you? Uh, you know, I don't know if there's any favorites on that list, or how did you come up with that list? Well, this list. This list was written, uh, again, I wrote it before October 7th, but it, unfortunately I was prescient and it's more it's more relevant today than ever. And remember Israel was under tremendous attack uh, inside inside our own our own people uh, before October 7th when we got when we became more unified. And we're challenged constantly. And what are, what are the background and facts? The facts of, of all these issues is buried by by emotions. Sometimes people speak out of emotions and don't understand things. Uh, for example, there's an International Holocaust Remembrance Association, the IHRA, and it get, they wrote this organization wrote about ten years ago the definition of anti-Semitism, which is widely accepted. It's a working definition. If you Google the uh, United States State Department and anti-Semitism, you're going to find a definition. But few people know about it. Anti-Semitism is not a uh, it's not something like they talk about pornography. We'll know it when we see it. What is the definition? Because the big question over the last decades is, is anti-Zionism part of anti-Semitism? And this IHRA definition unifies them completely. Uh, there's no difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. So people who claim... Yeah, that I, I got that in reading your Haggadah. That came out very clear yeah. and didn't know if that was your opinion or 
that was, a, but it's a very strong statement, which I yeah. wholeheartedly agree with. But if you can just sure. talk more about that, because that is a major point. Well, before before October seventh, we most a lot of people didn't think that the that anti Zionism was part of anti Semitism. Now, after October seventh, it's pretty obvious. I mean, Hamas attacks at Israel, and then anti Semites come out of the woodwork, uh, and Jews are attacked everywhere, you know, in writing, physically, economically. I mean, it's horrible. So, it, times have proven that, that that's correct. They're, they're both equal. The, but the the, inter, the IHRA definition of anti Semitism includes, it says that point blank, it says if once once you make Israel a pariah and treat Israel not like any other nation, then it becomes, then it's a part of anti Semitism. If Israel is, so someone you know, hates uh, Trump's or Biden's policy at the border, we don't see any BDS movement against America. We don't see any mass demonstrations in America all over the country. People threaten to leave, people threaten not to pay their taxes. We don't see that. But it, when Israel signaled out for doing something like that, more than any other country, that's anti-Semitism. When we're accused of dual loyalty, uh, you know, members of Congress who are Jewish were, were accused of, and Jews themselves are accused of being more loyal to, to, to Israel rather than America, that's called, that's dual loyalty. That, the dual loyalty. And these, these anti-Semitic uh, events are not new. Uh, our, our Passover story is, is full of the, the, the origins of anti-Semitism. The first anti-Semitism was, was when we were slaves in Egypt. The first charge of dual loyalty was Pharaoh against the Israelites. And it, it just goes on and on. And so yeah. these issues are important. And the, there is no separation now between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, even though people will deny that. Nice. The, very, the very foundation of Israel in uh, the vote in 1947 parti uh, partition by the United Nations was actually partly due to anti-Semitism because countries did not want the Jews after World War II. And, the, and there, were, there, were, there were limits to how many Jews could enter in all the countries of the world. They said, let's put them in Israel. And that's, why, that's why a lot of countries voted for Israel, all because of anti-Semitism in the countries. This is not a new problem. But we have to fight it. We have to stand up for it. God willing, we'll, we'll win. But it's, it's a tough battle. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're just about ready to take some questions. So okay. if anybody has questions, they can insert them. But before the, we do that, I thought your closing statement was very strong. And I'm going to put it up on the screen and ask if you can read it to everybody. And then we're going to... Uh, open it up for questions. So okay. bear with me as I just share the screen again. And we will. Uh, um, By the way, the, if we should mention there are two closings. There's the closing I wrote before October 7th and the closing I wrote after October 7th. Which one are you gonna read? Um, I think it's the last one, okay. but uh, you can tell me or if you have a preference. No, that I think they're both. Uh... Oops, I went too far. Good. This is it. Okay. Sure. Uh, as this Haggadah was going to press, horrif horrific events created a new reality that split time forever between before and after. October 6th, 2023. Israel was fractured, the government was fractured, Galut Jewry was fractured. October 7th, 2023, Shabbat and Simchat Torah. Hamas and Iran initiated a genocidal war against Israel. <clears throat> Over 1,300 Jews murdered, many thousands maimed, children behe beheaded, women raped. Hostages brought into Gaza. It was the deadliest attack on Israel ever. The primary purpose of a government is the protection of its citizens. In October 1962, the United States discovered <clears throat> excuse me, that Cuba was building sites for nuclear weapons. 
The crisis lasted 13 days. Hamas has been attacking Israel from Gaza Strip since 2007 for 16 years. Restraint is no longer an option. Temporarily, the Jewish world is united both, both in Israel and abroad. Every Israeli reservist has reported to the IDF. Temporarily, the Western world, especially the governments of the United States and Britain, are united in their support of Israel. Unfortunately, that's waning as we know. Within a week of the calamity, large fissures were already appearing. The American press still calls Hamas a militant organization instead of a terrorist organization. Pro-Israel rallies all over the world are counted by anti-Israeli rallies. Academic institutions all over America are either supporting or condoning the anti-Israeli stance. Anti-Semitic incidences, both passive and violent, are multiplying logarithmically all over the world. Already the world is tallying the numbers of Israelis killed versus Palestinians killed, a continued canard of moral equivalency. The canard that anti-Israel does not mean anti-Semitism is destroyed. We Jews are nearly alone again. Stories of Israeli heroism abound, and the Israeli civilian support for the IDF is unlimited. The hundreds of millions of dollars raised in one week for American Jews is astounding. Thousands of Galut Jews are volunteering in Israel. Many have attended rallies. Many have hosted uh, and attended IDF, friends of the IDF events. Many have volunteered to serve all over Israel. Many have donated. Many have prayed. What did you do? Yeah. And I guess I'll, I'll, I'll also ask, I know the answer to this, but share what you did, because you were sharing how you were just in the Israeli hospital. Sure. Well, uh, personally, uh, uh, two days after, three days after the after the war started, we had a major a fundraising event in our house for the uh, friends of the idea. I'm not pushing this one. I, it's a great organization. There are many other organizations that I contribute to on behalf of Israel. It happened to have a fundraiser in our house, and I sought for uh, I sought for weeks to find out how I can help uh, in Israel. There is an organization of volunteer uh, doctors in Israel, of America to Israel. There's seven thousand of us. But the Israeli Health Department, the ministry was in chaos. And uh, so I, on my own, I sent emails to, I'm a gastroenterologist, emails to the Health Department heads of gastroenterology all over Israeli hospitals. And Adassa Hospital answered me immediately. I said, well, as soon as you get me a license, uh, I'm coming right over. And within a week, they gave me a license. Uh, there were four of their doctors who were in the Milawim and the reserves fighting in Gaza. Uh, two of those doctors lost lost brothers fighting in, 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 in Gaza. They desperately needed me. And uh, the appreciation and respect I got in that month, it was amazing. Hadassah Hospital was actually an oasis. There, a lot of the patients were Arab. A lot of the house staff, the doctors, the nurses were Arab. It was, it was complete peace and camaraderie. And it was something that you don't hear about. But uh, nothing, I, I didn't expect it to be that way. So it had it was just a wonderful experience, and my wife and I are going in May again to to volunteer this time in in the agriculture. And hopefully, I'll go in September also. Uh, I just I think Israel needs us. We need Israel. We're not going to this volunteer work in in Israel is not just to make us feel good. It really makes the Israelis feel good because they they feel they're alone, and we come to support them. They really appreciate it. So I hope yeah. all of you have a chance to do as best as yeah, you can. Yeah, no, fantastic call. Yeah. About, uh, that was uh, very you. impressive and a great example for others to follow. Um, okay, so we're now going to open up the lines for some questions. And uh, I assume I'll see them in the chat. If anybody has a question, we'll, we'll just read them aloud. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody had asked, uh, Margaret, what assignments do you recommend giving ahead of the Seder? Uh -huh. Well, you have to the, you have to decide on the age group of, of who's coming, and every family is going to be different in this regard. Uh, the thirteen topics that I outlined in in the questions to discuss at the at, during the dinner, those are going to be the main assignments for my family. It's, it's it's too much to cover all of them. You, you pick a few. They're fortunate there are two Sidarim. 
But if if the children are involved, you just sign you just assign uh, get, when children get involved, you sign them the symbolism of the kiddush cup or the wine or the challah or the wine or breaking the matzah, give them costumes, give them skits. All the, all the families with young children, uh, we assign them musicals and skits and to sing songs. It makes them gets them involved in the, in the preliminaries. It's very very wonderful. We always enact a play for the plagues. But the intellectual assignments uh, should be about modern Israel. The topics are there. And uh, very important not to to handle it uh, politically correct, diplomatically correct. You don't want to have fissures in your family. Make sure you know who's, who's coming and what their opinions are, because you don't want to turn them off. You want them to come back next year. And every family is going to have to decide for themselves how to handle that. But I've, I've been sometimes, I've, I've, you don't have to do, my, if you're afraid to do modern, you know, what's going on now, you could do with the history of uh, Israeli wars, you can do history of uh, Zionist Congress with with Herzl, you, you can do the Israeli uh, electoral system, the political parties, you can do the history of the pick, pick prime ministers, there's all these things you can do. But, but I would suggest you put Israel into your, into your Seder discussion. Don't make the theme something you know, from 2000 years ago. Uh, and you could do that, of course, but this is not the, I don't, I don't, I don't think this year is the time to do that. So you'll, you'll find a good one. And if you read my God, you'll definitely find good suggestions. Yeah. Got it. Great. Um, the, uh, we had one question from somebody asking about what is the status of BDS? Uh, I don't know if they were asking about the definition or the status or, what's going on on campus, which unfortunately there's been a lot. Sure. Um, and then I see somebody raise their hand, Anne, if you want to maybe type your question or if I can call on you, but go ahead. You want to respond so, to the BDS? Yeah, BDS uh, is addressed in, in my Haggadah. Uh, it's first to understand that BDS is an anti-Semitic movement. It's singling out Israel more than any other country. When, when you have someone want to boycott uh, Israel, but not boycott Iran or Syria or any countries where atrocities are horrendous, and the single like Israel, it's an anti-Semitic movement. It was started by a guy named Barakudi, who uh, got his, actually his PhD in Tel Aviv University and um, years ago, about 15 years ago. And he started the BDS movement to delegitimize de de the existence of Israel. That's the origin of BDS. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's hard to defend it anywhere. Even if, I wouldn't even defend it in the, in the, from the territories, separate the territories, what they produce from, uh, from, it, from the from main Israel outside the, inside and outside the Green Line. Uh, one example of BDS is uh, the story with SodaStream. Uh, SodaStream had a factory in, in, in the West Bank, Judea Samaria. They had, they had about 500 uh, Palestinian employees, and it was very peaceful there. And the BDS movement made, made SodaStream move uh, to inside the Green Line, and they had to fire all the Palestinian employees. There, despite what you read, there's a lot of cooperation and economic, and, uh, economic cooperation in the West Bank, Judea Samaria. And the BDS movement makes everybody suffer. So it's the wrong thing to do. There are other ways to, there are other ways to handle, uh, if you dislike what Israel is doing, a BDS is not one of them. Right. Yeah, okay, here's another question for Mark. What can we do as the Jewish people to find common ground as it relates to Israelis' response to October 7th? Well, I presume you're talking about the uh, what's going on with the civilians in Gaza. If I read that correctly, that's a very tough call. Mm -hmm. And I did address this a bit in uh, in my Haggadah, but there's no there's no good answer. So the ways the ways I addressed it, I'll elaborate a little bit. We talk about the tenth plague. The tenth plague. God punished 
not just the, the families of Pharaoh and the generals and the leaders of Egypt, God punished every Egyptian family down to the guy cleaning the streets, the manual laborers. And what could say, well, why, why did God do that? And the answer is, if you remember when October 7th, how many gods and citizens were celebrating, it was, it was, a, it was a victory party uh, in Gaza, it was a victory party in the West Bank, because the citizens supported the rape and murder and pillage of, of, the, of this massacre. And they didn't stop Hamas, they never did from firing the rockets, there was no protest against Hamas. Maybe they had no choice, but God punished them. And Jonathan Goldhagen wrote a book about the Holocaust, after the Holocaust saying, the old, basically said that all, all the Germans are guilty because again, they did nothing to stop it. But then we have the opposite side where we learn that uh, we, have, we have to be sympathetic because we were slaves in Egypt. There's a Midrash that when, when we crossed the, the Red Sea, the Reed Sea and Miriam is celebrating and singing the, the song of the sea that the angels were singing also with the Israelites. And God said, no, you can't, you can't sing. You, the angels, you cannot, because the, the, the Egyptians are also my creatures and they're suffering. And we have the cup of wine. When we put dip our finger in and, and put it on the napkin for the 10th plague, we're remembering that it's not a full cup of happiness, people are suffering. So it's a very tough call, uh, Israel's survival, Israel's security, the guys and citizens are certainly suffering. Uh, and yeah, it, it's a very difficult yeah. situation. And I, the only answer I could give you that's, that's a decent one is what Golda Meir said. And this quote is, is in her in an Agata. Uh, she said, I can forgive the Arabs for killing our children, but I can never forgive them for making us kill their children. Yeah. And there will never be peace until the Arabs love their children more than they hate us. Yeah. And that, that, yeah. that quote is very so poignant. true. Yeah. So, um, here's another heart, question. The heart, uh, heart breaks when we see the pictures of suffering oh, Gaza. Yeah. But still, Israel's got to have spite for its survival. Yeah. yeah. Um, here's a question from Anne where she's asking about, first, she's thanking you. She's Israeli for all your volunteer work and, and to everybody who for their support and volunteerism in Israel. Uh, she wanted to get your opinion on how do you talk to kids and how do you teach small kids during the Seder about what's going on in Israel, especially yeah. re regarding the hostages? Yeah, uh, that's a tough one. I don't think this is, I don't think it's appropriate for small kids. I don't know what the definition of small kids is. I, I, I've got my grandchildren, uh, who are in Lafell, uh, the ones under the age of 12 don't know, they're not, they're taught still the joy of Israel, the singing flags and celebrating and Purim co costumes. They're not taught what's going on. Uh, whether that's right or wrong, uh, I think that's going to be up to the individual family. As the kids mature, I think they, they should be taught what's going on. And I don't, Right now, I don't. There's no real educational policy in in Jewish schools and yeshivot on how to handle this. Uh, and I think it's if the parents personally, I I pull my uh, my older grandchildren aside and, and I tell them what's going on. It's, I don't want to show them pictures of atrocities, but I just tell them why Israel is being attacked and what's going on. It's yeah. a tough one, and every kid is sensitive too. And if you don't want a child to wake up with nightmares every day that people hate us. Yeah. If you impart, yeah. then I got in the city, you impart, you impart that Jews are special, we're privileged, we're chosen, and we should be celebrating that we're Jewish. Uh, I don't think young teaching young children that we're getting tortured at the Seder is appropriate right now. I don't yeah. know if that gives you an answer, but that's the way it feel. Nice. Anne is also texting that that. Her kids, uh, I guess the Grinberg kids, are friends with your grandkids. So, uh, well, that's yeah, nice. which is nice. <laughs> um, all right, before I get to the next question, uh, Madeline, I'll ask your question as a final question. Just wanted to take a second and thank Westchester Jewish Council. And for those of you who don't know, Westchester Jewish Council is an umbrella organization in Westchester with 134 Jewish organizations that are members of it and working closely 
you know, works closely with all these groups. And as you may know, Westchester, as a, the county of Westchester, is the eighth largest Jewish community in the U.S. with over 150,000 Jews. And they, uh, the Westchester Jewish Council has been around since 1975. It actually came together after the uh, Yom Kippur War. And now it is more active and doing amazing things with events and rallies and, and supporting uh, initiatives on anti-Semitism all over the county. Uh, and I'll just read other things that they, uh, yeah, their goal here is really to connect, convene, safeguard Westchester Jewish communities and strengthen relationships amongst Jews and among our member organizations and all of Israel and uh, all of Westchester to connect all of Westchester to Israel and and so forth so uh so thank you to westchester jewish council for sponsoring and coordinating this all right the final question wait, 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 wait can i want to add to that yeah. let me add to that for a second please yes please i want to i also want to thank the west jewish council for allowing me to pr present my haggadah and i want to especially uh give honor to the the staff of the western jewish council the chief executive officer elliot forshammer yes Pam goldstein the operating officer Donna Bartell was the program director who organized all this. Lori Kurlander, Aline Schonbrunn, Tamia Arnowitz, Margot Lampert. They're, it's an amazing team. And thank you for doing, for arranging this. And I, I hope the message got across of what the Seder should look like and how Passover is to make it a Zionist holiday. And then I'll be very happy. But thank you. Great. Thank you for do, doing this. So your final question is from a woman named Madeline, who's actually, she says she's a former patient. And she's a writer for the Times of Israel and wants to uh -huh. interview you separately. So I'll send this. She gives the other info. But she wanted to get your opinion on the ISGAP and noting that Qatar participation in funding U.S. demonstrations in Israel. What is your opinion on that? And, and I guess I know I've read a lot from Barry Weiss that she's uncovered a lot of this this. Uh, uh, terrible funding of Qatar to institutions and things like that. Uh, I'm going to pass on that one. Uh, okay. I know, I'm not. I'm not an expert on this. I hope you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> I should, no, the person not who at asked all. the question. The person who asked the question should probably tell us, give us a lecture on that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I, so, I apologize for that one. Okay. Yeah. So with that, I will now bring this to a close by, uh, hold on, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen here. And is it working? Uh, hold on one sec. This hopefully will work. Stop the share. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give, uh, give me a 30 second time to give one lesson from the Haggadah. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, when Jacob's name was changed from uh, Yaakov to Israel, uh, it was very interesting. Uh, Yaakov was a guy who was running away his entire life. He ran away because it was his brother Esau. He ran away from Levan, his, his uh, father-in-law. And he, he was sort of a wuss. He didn't want to stand up and fight for himself. But when finally he had the strength to wrestle the angel, and that's when his name was changed to Israel. Israel means, it's a symbol of, of a name that means we fight and defend ourselves and stand up for ourselves. And that's why Israel was called Israel today. And that's a message from the Haggadah. So that's the story. Great. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to end with the uh, a song. Hopefully this will. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you very much all for right. coming. Thank you, WJC. Yeah. That's true. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. All right. Yeah.